want you to journey with me just for a moment to Jericho Road and meet Bartimaeus. Bartimaeus was blind, and at that time in the culture, there were, the people wore two cloaks. One was the cloak, the inner cloak, that was long before Fruit of the Loom was born, and the other was the outer cloak. And that outer cloak was used to keep people warm. Uh, it was so important to people, if you used it as collateral, it had to be given back to you at night. But if you happen to be blind like Bartimaeus, what they would do, because there was no society for the blind, they would lay their cloak on the ground alongside the road and hope that as people came by, they would drop a coin, maybe some bread, something to keep them alive. At night, they would not being able to see where they were going, like Bartimaeus, perhaps there was a shelter that he stayed in, maybe a barn, something like that. And he would use that cloak to keep him warm at night. And the next day he would be back by the road, the cloak in front of him, his only means of life. He counted on people dropping a coin or a little bread or something. So what did Bartimaeus do when Jesus called him? He stood up and he took his cloak and he threw it aside and he ran to Jesus. How's a blind man gonna find his cloak? And chances are somebody would steal it anyway. Bartimaeus threw aside everything he had to keep him alive. He cast it aside to follow a man he could not see. Many churches, not all, but many churches have cloaks. Some of those cloaks even have names. We've always done it this way. That's the name of my cloak. If you change that, I'm leaving. That's the name of my cloak. As you go forward from here with a new pastor coming in just a couple weeks, I want you to think about the cloak that you have and the cloak perhaps this church has. Are you willing to cast that cloak aside? Dear friends, grace and peace to you in the name of our crucified and risen Savior Jesus, who is the Christ. Amen. Well, this is almost the last of the stewardship program, so this is my stewardship sermon. <laughs> Don't everybody run at once. Don't let them out, Phil. <laughs> How many of you have ever been in a church that's been financially struggling. <laughs> I've served in churches where the bills were pinned to a bulletin board each month in hopes that some kind soul would take one off and pay it. I've served in churches where the worship service was moved from the sanctuary to the fellowship hall because they couldn't afford to heat the sanctuary. I've served in churches where important new ministry opportunities were rejected because they weren't in the budget and would have to wait. Does that sound familiar? Sadly, it is for many churches. But have you ever been in a church so financially secure that new ministries to transform lives could be considered without the first question being, I don't know, I don't think we can afford to do that. Is it possible to even dream that could happen? Perhaps the answer lies in a perception of church stewardship that is grounded in history. A history that is budget first, not ministry first. 
a budget that focuses often focuses attention on scarcity rather than the abundance of God. Chris Christopher in his book, Not Your Parents' Offering Plate, says that, I quote, the church is the only nonprofit I know that seems to believe that the more you cry that you're sinking, the more people will give to you. The exact opposite is true. Let me repeat that. The church is the only nonprofit I know that seems to believe that when you, that the more you cry that you are sinking, the more people will give. The exact opposite is true. Do you agree with him? If so, and I would happen to think he's right, then what is missing in the mindset of congregations? Churches somehow believe that because we're a church, that people will simply give to meet the budget. That is a mindset that honors budget, not ministry. In the past four years, for lots of reasons, the world of the church has changed. The world of Agnes Day has changed. Yet churches remain stuck in the old attitude that for the sake of the church, people will simply give budget honored on to next year. I guess my answer to that way of thinking in today's world would be hogwash. That doesn't work anymore. And that truth is revealed as more and more churches struggle for survival and relevance in our modern world. What then is missing? How do we overcome the old attitudes and expectations? The answer, I believe, is a change in focus. A focus not on budget shortfalls, but on mission and ministry. A missional focus that it, as a church, we exist for one reason and one reason only, to transform lives through the gospel of Jesus Christ. To be the light, the light that shines brightly for all to see, the light of Christ focused on God's mission and the ministries of transformation, ministries that transform lives for the sake of the good news of Jesus Christ. Christopher says it, says it pretty plainly in his book, and again I quote, you, dear church, are in the business to change lives for the sake of the gospel of Jesus Christ. You have no other reason to exist. And I'll repeat that again. You, dear church, are in the business to change lives for the sake of the gospel of Jesus Christ. You have no other reason to exist. If you're not doing that, he says, get out of the way and let somebody else do it. This church called Lamb of God exists for no other reason than to transform the lives of each of you and to transform the lives of people outside these church walls, to transform them through the good news of Jesus Christ, to transform lives lived in darkness to lives lived in the bright light of Christ, lives that become a city on the hill for all to see. battery, so I got to talk faster. <laughs> to transform lives lived in darkness to lives lived in the bright light of Christ. That and that alone is why everything here exists. The mission of God, transforming lives. We don't pay the mortgage so we can have a fine building. We pay the mortgage so that we might have a sacred place to worship God, where all are welcome and lives are transformed by God's word and grace. We don't just pay the mortgage so we can have a fine sanctuary. We pay the mortgage so that the AA group that meets here might have their lives transformed. We don't pay the mortgage just so we can have a church to worship in. We pay the mortgage so that people with no safe place to sleep can have access to safe parking and food in the little food pantry. We pay the mortgage so that young children at Little Lambs Preschool might learn and grow and have their lives transformed. 
through God's mission. We don't pay the mortgage so we can sing praises to a fine building or to, a, to this church. We pay the mortgage so that our choirs and our bell ringers can sing and ring in God's glory, transforming lives. We don't just pay the electric bill. So we can stay warm here in the sanctuary. We pay the electric bill so that we can hold children's programs and adult forum ministry to transform lives. We pay the electric bill so that people trapped in addictions might find a place to meet and find a way to come out of their darkness. We don't pay the electric bill just so we can make bulletins and newsletters and make copies and produce reports. We pay the electric bill so that our quilters and our knitters have a warm, bright place to make beautiful quilts and prayer shawls so that those living in cold darkness might be touched by the warm love of God. We don't pay the electric bill just so we can see the bulletin on Sunday morning. We pay the electric bill so that community groups can meet here, sing here, have programs here, and have lives transformed here. Dear friends, as much as this may come as a shock, we don't pay the water bill so we can have coffee on Sunday morning. <laughs> we pay the water bill so that Advent and Lenten services and programs on Wednesday nights can be held and transform lives. We don't pay the staff because there happens to be offices to sit in. We pay the staff for ministries and programs they develop and lead, ministries that transform lives, both young and old alike. Ministries of worship, music, adult forum, Bible studies, children and youth, community outreach, and ministries around the world. We make summer lunches in the kitchen to help hungry kids have food to eat and hope for a better life, hope that will transform their lives. We collect food for fish to feed the hungry. We fill school kits so that needy children can learn and have their lives transformed. We do all these things and much, much more for one reason and one reason only, God's mission to transform lives through the love of Jesus Christ. We don't do that to honor a budget. We do this to honor God and God's mission here in Gig Harbor and around the world. To honor God in thanksgiving for the free gift of grace and unconditional love given to us and to all people. Isn't that what God chooses? Not a fast in sackcloth or ashes, but a mission that acts to transform hearts and minds for the gospel. A mission that shares our bread with the hungry. A mission that provides clothes for the needy and affirms our love of neighbor. A mission that looses the bonds of injustice. A mission that stands with the marginalized and sets the oppressed free. A mission that protects and cares for creation. That's why we exist. That is our mission, the mission of God to transform lives for the sake of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And when that is our mission, when that is our focus, when that is the way we live our lives in Christ, well, dear friends, you'll never have to listen to another stewardship plea again. And the light of Christ that is Agnes Day Lutheran Church and each of you, each of you, because you, you are this church, that light will shine with brightness that will light up the heavens and light up the hearts of all who are touched and transformed here in this place. On this last Sunday that I stand before you to share God's word, I ask you to remember this. The business of this church is not a budget. Is a budget important? Yes. But a budget is not why we are here. A budget is not our God. The business of this church is ministry and mission, and that is the only reason we exist. Mission that transforms lives, ministries that transform lives. And dear friends, that is not our mission. That is God's mission. 
After service today, you'll meet to discuss church finances. I want you to remember that our mission is not to honor and worship a budget. We're here to honor and worship God and live out God's mission, God's mission, our mission to transform lives for the sake of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Dear friends, God has chosen each of you to be Christ's church in this place at this time. And God has chosen wisely. Are you ready to join Pastor JT and perhaps throw off your cloak and follow Christ? May God bless you on your journey. Amen. <laughs>